uh, today is the 27th October 2020 and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Benoit Barbel. Uh, he is uh, he's from Canada. He has obtained his PhD at University of Montreal in the Molecular Biology program and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Research Center of CHU University of Laval in Quebec City. He has been devoting his career on human retroviruses such as HIV-1 and HTLV-1. A large part of his research relates to human endogenous viruses and their role in placenta formation. And his recent focus on this topic has been their association to extracellular vesicles. So today he is going to give lecture on contribution of human endogenous retrovirus envelope proteins to properties associated with extracellular vesicles. So please welcome Benoit. Thank you so much, Carolina, for giving me the opportunity to present the, the data that we've and our results uh, in our that we obtained in my lab uh, uh, over the several number of years. Um, our lab has been uh, very much interested for a number of years into what is called human endogenous retroviruses, and how actually they are not only implicated in the development of the placenta, but also how they actually manage to act on the properties of extracellular vesicles. Now briefly, I need to introduce you to what are human endogenous retroviruses and what is the what's the interest that we have in endogenous retroviruses. So basically, human endogenous retroviruses are basically eight per represent 8% 8 of the human genome. So it's a very important uh, constituent of our genome and very little is known actually as to what they are uh, doing in our genome, what functional aspect they, uh, they bear and, and how they are interacting with either the cellular gene in terms of gene regulation or also, and most importantly for this topic, how some of the produced protein from these sequence are actually functionally affecting some function, some, some of the properties of uh, the placenta. And the way uh, these sequences have been incorporated in our genome is fairly well understood. Uh, basically what happened, and we're talking about 10 to 20 or more million years ago, infectious retroviruses, and, which are normal viruses, which normally infects and when in their life cycle, integrate the genome of infected cells. So the, uh, those millions of years ago, certain retroviruses have infected our ancestors and actually had uh, infected germ cells. And these germ cells being infected have therefore gave birth, gave gen the generation of uh, individual from our population, which had the in integrated genome of the infectious virus inside all of these cells. And basically what happened is that through these millions of years, we have co-opted through the that phenomenon of retroviral infection, a number, a series of different retroviruses sequences, which have been finally uh, stably in, uh, fixed in our genome. And obviously throughout the millions of years, basically if you look at the genome of a retrovirus, which uh, at a simple form contains three genes, in throughout the millions of years, all these sequences which has been co-opted by our genome has been kind of cleaned up in the sense that some of the genes have been mutated and very little sequence have been uh, have remained. And what we know now, sorry, uh, is that actually there is a few number of genes from these initial infection infection agents which have remained in our genome and which are actually capable of producing certain proteins. And as we'll see, some of these proteins are actually former envelope proteins from these retroviruses. And as a comparison, that's why I was, I'm showing you basically what the typical retroviral infection in a trans, original transmission looks like, just like HIV-1, which is not necessarily, uh, unless uh, in terms of the HIV, it's a bit of different, but the, normally it goes to horizontal transmission. So, so now these genes that I was referring to are called envelope genes. So there, these envelope genes are producing proteins and they're actually capable of producing protein from our human genome. And they were just rem remember that these proteins were normally before being co-opted by our, by our genome were former envelope proteins where we were sitting on the surface of the virus and allowing the virus to infect st target cells, 
by binding and then fusing the viral membrane to the plasma membrane of the infected cell. But what has been noticed by the group from by Cherry Edmonds group is that there were a number of envelope genes from different uh, retroviral origin which were present in our genome, which could actually produce these proteins. And some were capable of producing a fairly complete protein which very big, uh, large similarity with the uh, typical envelope proteins of retroviruses. And that is not only in the human species, because as you know, endogenous retroviruses are present in a number of species. But what is, has been apparent is that a lot of mammalian species are capable of doing of producing envelope proteins from these ancestral retroviral sequence. And each envelope proteins are actually coming from a different event of a retroviral infection from their own ancestors and therefore have been preserved and conserved in their genome independently, showing a very strong phenomenon of convergent evolution. But the question is why have we kept those encoding envelope protein in our genome, not only human species, but rodent species, all these different species which are presented in this uh, slide. And the answer came uh, something like 20 years ago, very clear demonstration of how these envelope proteins, so retroviral and endogenous retroviral sequence, which have been conserved throughout those millions of years and capable of producing proteins. Now, to what extent and to what function they might they could be associated with? And the answer came by the study done on the placenta. And if you look at the placenta, obviously the placenta is a very important, fundamental, uh, uh, essential uh, organ for proper um, you know, fetus development. And what it does is that it has different structures, which one of them is called, some of them called villi. And these villi are actually baiting into the maternal blood. And they're essential actually to transfer and to allow the uh, uh, continuous exchange between maternal circulation and fetal circulation of uh, different gases such as oxygen, but also nutrients and certain waste products. Now, these structures are also known to contain a, a, a layer, a multinuclear nuclear layer called the Saint-Cytotrophoblast. And this structure, like I said, is a multinuclear and it is overlaying in at the tip of all these villi, a, no, a set of cells called cytotrophoblastic cells. Now, what was known is that these cytotrophoblastic cells are important because they differentiate and eventually fuse with the sensitotrophoblast layer, allowing that sensitotrophoblast to be maintained dynamically and to be capable of, uh, uh, of maintaining a cer certain uh, uh, size and also uh, function. So what has been finally determined in, uh, in 2000 is that there's a two different, 2000 and later, there's two different proteins which are actually expressed along in the cytotrophoblast just below the sensitotrophoblast. And these proteins are now known as sensitin-1 and sensitin-2. And these proteins are actually the driving force between the fusion events occurring between the cytotrophoblast cells to the sensitotrophoblast. And what came to be discovered was that the envelope protein, the sensitin-1 and sensitin-2 were actually former envelope protein of retroviral retroviruses, which have infected the, our ancestor millions of years ago, and therefore are part of what we know now as human endogenous retroviral sequence. So in the human endogenous retroviral sequence, we are producing two proteins. And these two proteins are produced from two different Earth sequences. And these proteins being former envelope proteins of retroviruses, which were responsible for the fusion, the, the binding and the fusion of the virus to the membrane of the cell, are actually now being used by cytotrophoblast cells just right here. And by interacting with their specific receptor are capable, just like a virus binding to the target cell, to mediate fusion of the cytotrophoblast cells to the sensitotrophoblast. So basically, and this is more clearly demonstrated here, you can see that the cytotrophoblast cells for the sensitin-2 protein 
express it on the surface and bind to the receptor. And the receptors for each of these sensitin 1 and sensitin 2 are known, and they're for sensitin 2 is known as MFSD2A. Now, like I said, sensitin 1 and 2, therefore, have been extremely well studied for at least 20 years. We know that it's part of what we call the human endogenous retroviral sequence. They are present in two different locations in our genome, two different chromosomes, and the structure of a typical retroviral integration sequence is presented here. And in that structure, only the envelope gene is being produced, not the two other genes, producing the sensitin 2 protein. That sensitin protein also is capable of maturing just like a, it's first, sorry, it's first synthesized as a poly, uh, polypeptide, which is then cleaved at a very precise site, allowing it to form a, a two subunit structure. One is being called the SU structure, the other the transmembrane structure. And this is exactly a typical uh, confirmation that uh, a typical retroviral envelope protein adopts on the surface of the virus, and this time it is displayed on the surface of the cytotrophoblast cells. Now, not only does it display the proper orientation and, and confirmation, but it also has the typical function attributed to envelope protein on the surface retrovirus. That is, it mediates fusion through its fusion peptide. It has a transmembrane domain, but also it also has what I'll be referring to later, what we call an immunosuppressive domain, which is present in blue right here. So we have been studying these proteins and have focused mostly on sensitin 2 And we've been using two different cell systems. One is just called BWO cell lines, which are actually cell lines, which are trophoblast-like that we can induce to fuse in the cell culture by adding porcelain or a combination of activating agents. And it, during our initial study a number of years ago, we had demonstrated that versus sensitin 1, sensitin 2 actually with sRNA was much more important in mediating this fusion. So this is a typical, uh, very uh, standard me method that you, we use to quantify cell fusion events. Uh, it, it has some disadvantage, but nonetheless, that was the typical standard uh, protocol that we were using. Uh, we also have a second system that we're using, and therefore, this one relies more on primary cells. And if we just basically isolate villocytotrophoblast cells, those who are responsible for fusing with the, the sensitotrophoblast. And once you isolate these cells from the placenta and you culture them for four days, they undergo spontaneous fusion, therefore creating what we refer to as a sensitotrophoblast like fusion, uh, like, like a structure. And you can actually use these cells to mimic uh, the condition in the placenta of these cytotrophoblast cells, but also some of the phenotype associated to these cells. And again, using this in this slide, the, the same sRNA approach, uh, uh, knockdown appro uh, sorry, approach, we were able to show once again that the sensitin 2 protein by once it was the gene was silenced was definitely more uh, important in inducing these fusion events. And because of these observations and also because most researchers were focusing on sensitin, when we have started in our lab, we have been focusing more on sensitin too. But one of the questions that came to mind with all these studies, since it had been known that placental cells, mostly sensitotrophoblasts, can actually produce a certain number of phyto, uh, of microvesicles, including in what we were, we were referring back then to exosomes, the question was whether these proteins, just being membrane at the plasma membrane, could actually also be part of extracellular vesicles. So to answer that question, we therefore decided to call, go back to our system and to culture villocytotrophoblastic cells. And these cells were fairly easy to isolate. And once we had them cultured for day one to day four, day four being the uh, time timeline, uh, the time lapse where you had the most fusion events, we started collecting, harvesting, uh, supernatant and uh, purifying exosome, uh, what we refer to exosome, but we, we, from now on, I'll be referring to extracellular vesicles. Um, using uh, centrifugation, ultracentrifugation with differential ultracentrifugation. And we were looking at uh, different values in terms of size, electron microscopy. Uh, and also we were looking at different, uh, different parameters. And I, I, so when we had all these exome, uh, all these extracellular vesicles, sorry, 
the first question was to determine whether we could actually uh, detect these um, sensitive one and sensitive two protein on the surface of these vesicles. And using a flow cytometry based assay where the uh, extracellular vesicles are just overlaid on beads, we could, in that standard and very, uh, very standard method, we could actually answer the question that both at different times of uh, harvesting of the extracellular vesicle, we could indeed detect sensitin 1 and sensitin at the surface. And we had using this time, back then we were using CD63 as a control. And we also did a number of additional analysis by Western blog showing that a marker called the phospholipase, uh, the, sorry, the alkaline phosphatase placenta of the placenta was present on the exome. And that was known uh, a number of years ago, but we could also confirm that sensitin 1 and 2 by Western blood analysis of the exome was uh, seemingly present in these, in these um, preparations. We also very importantly wanted to determine whether if you, we were collecting serum uh, from uh, pregnant women, could we also detect and confirm the presence of sensitin 1 and 2? And so using uh, the exoquick protocol, we were uh, we and doing the analysis in the sense in electron microscopy, and back then we were looking at acetyl cholesterol esterase activity. We also were capable of determining that indeed we were sensitive one and two was being detected by Western law. And so therefore that was confirming our results that at least these extracellular vesicles, even in from serum sample, serum sample we were, were uh, contained at their surface, both proteins. And these also were in, uh, in this slide, you can see also the control. But very importantly and interestingly in that part of the, of our pro of our uh, research was to try to demonstrate whether these extracellular vesicles could be used to um, die, uh, do uh, have an early diagnosis of um, of uh, preeclampsia. The reason why we focus on that was that it was known that uh, sensitin one, in, especially sensitin one, was lower in abundance in placenta for uh, from patient where we're showing severe preeclampsia. And we, uh, in a study, previous study, we had shown that if we were studying, looking at placenta from either normal or severe preeclampsia patient, we were seeing a very important reduction in sensitin two level, especially in severe cases versus moderate cases, which were also showing statistics as statistically significant drop in sensitin level. And that was much more uh, important than for sensitin two. But um, uh, using an ELISA assay, we could uh, based assay that we have developed ourselves and using CD63 as um, as a normalizing uh, marker, we could again demonstrate that if you use extracellular vesicle from serum samples, again, you, we were seeing that uh, the sensitin to level was reduced on the surface of these vesicles and therefore suggesting an opening the door to the possibility of using extracellular vesicles early on from um, pregnant women to determine whether they are predisposed to uh, preeclampsia or not. And this is very important because right now at this very moment, this such a marker or a series of markers is lacking uh, to uh, try to target women, which uh, pregnant women who might be like more likely to develop this severe disorder. Um, that we have uh, more recently uh, started, uh, well, more recently, in, in number uh, five years ago, we had started a cohort and been in of several pregnant women. And again, looking at, making a, an analysis, the same type of Elisa assay, we were confirming a very early on actually uh, at the first semester, although the, these uh, standard deviation are pretty high, nonetheless, we seem to suggest that there's statistic significance here in the terms of abundance of the sensitive two marker on the surface of extracellular vesicle of women who are showing normal pregnancy versus preeclamptic. Uh, uh, patients, but this has to be, there's more study that needs to be done for that. The other part of that, that the project that initially was focusing on the, uh, what we call exomorphic extracellular vesicle was trying to determine what happens in terms of these extracellular vesicles once they're in contact of target cells. And what we have used as a target cell was, as I was referring initially, 
BWO cells. So remember, these are extracellular vesicles that we have isolated from viabilis cytotrophoblast cells that we're putting in contact with this time BWO cells, which are trophoblast cell line, uh, trophoblast like cell line. And although this was just a, a chosen cell model because we knew uh, very much how to study it, but there's different cell line that we, we want to study and we have studied after. But using uh, extracellular vesicle, which was which were uh, stained with, uh, or, or, or sorry, um, uh, yeah, stain incubated with the PKH67 fluorochrome, we were able to follow the internalization of these extracellular vesicles, and we could see that in vivo cells, the internalization was quite rapid. We also used different markers of early endosomes, or again, uh, more uh, later, uh, or lysosome, and we could see actually that the, um, the, 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 the uh, internalization of these extracellular vesicles was probably going through the endosome, but endosome, but are were actually very not that much going through the lysosome pathway, therefore not being degraded. The question then we asked was whether, since we had villocytotrophoblasts and producing extracellular vesicles, which were likely um, uh, which were uh, contained on their surface, like I told you, it's sensitive one and two. The question that we then asked was whether those proteins were being involved in the internalization, the uptake of our extracellular vesicle by our target cells. And to do so, what we basically did was to knock out the expression of sensitin 1 or sensitin 2 in villocytotrophoblast before harvesting the extracellular vesicle. And upon doing this, doing fluorocytometry analysis or even confocal microscopy, we noticed that actually there was a very important drop in internalization, uh, either when science system ones was uh, knocked down on the surface of the extracellular vesicle or sensitin two. And uh, these are where some blood are showing you how much uh, that the work, knockdown work. And these are this time. This is a time course showing you that the uh, sensitin one and two knockout really affect the uh, internalization, the uptake of, of the virus, of the, sorry, of the, uh, of the extracellular vesicle. We have done similar experiments with uh, UVEX cells this time because UVEX cells are endothelial cells. And we know that actually the uh, endothelial cells are in, uh, in, the, in the nearby placenta, most likely in the uterine wall are greatly uh, reorganized uh, by being replaced by trophoblast cells, which are called extravillous uh, trophoblast cells and therefore cytotrophoblast cells. And uh, what we have done actually is therefore, we, we, we have argued that perhaps these, ex these extracellular vesicles could affect some function of the endothelial cells. So we've looked at how also they might actually interact with the and being internalized by UVEX cells and using the same extracellular vesicles we have shown that indeed they are being internalized uh, to a certain level. And this is, these are data showing in this case, uh, actually uh, uh, extra cell, uh, sorry, over here it was from a supernatant of, um, of, of extra, uh, villus cytotrophoblasts. We saw a fairly decent internalization using the uh, PKH67 label uh, extracellular vesicle, although not to the same extent as to BWO cells, our initial cell line. But we also saw that studying or taking um, serum, um, serum derived uh, uh, ex uh, extracellular vesicles from pregnant women, we also noticed that there was a fairly good uptake in UVIC cells by these cell line. We had controls showing that this was specific. Most exciting was the fact that if you were using this time extracellular vesicles from ec 293 T cells, which are either expressing sensitin 2 or not, we noticed that there was a, in, an important increase in uptake, showing that even in UVEX cell, the interaction of extracellular vesicles with uh, these UVEX cells are more important if sensitin 2 is expressed. And also, in the reverse, remember that extracellular vesicles, which are coming from uh, severe preeclamptic patients, have lesser sensitin too. We saw that compared to normal uh, extracellular vesicles, that is from serum samples, they were much less prone to be internalized 
in UVXL. Although there's a lot of different possibility that could explain this lower level of internalization, it's an interesting parallel that we're drawing between these, these results where since the M2 is expressing these, is present on the surface of these extracellular vesicles <coughs> versus these extracellular vesicles where there's a, a, a certain uh, a common effect. So our hypothesis and the way we're seeing our data or treating our data is that extracellular vesicles which are produced by villus cytotrophobac cell and contain on their surface sensitin 1 and 2 are actually behaving in certain way <clears throat> like a retro <coughs> sorry like a retrovirus since these proteins are also from a retrovirus uh, uh, former former retrovirus we can actually believe that some of the behavior of these extracellular vesicles could be related to the way retroviruses are acting. First of all, by their capacity through sensitin 1 and 2 to interact with their receptor and then to be uh, and, uh, internalized in an endosome. And second, and after possibly by interact after interaction with the, uh, their receptor being capable of fusing and therefore releasing for <clears throat> retroviruses would be releasing its capsin and its viral RNA for ensuing replication, but in the case for extracellular vesicle is <clears throat> uh, liberating its content and therefore affecting uh, cell phenotype and cell behavior. But however, there, as I said, there's a, we have looked basically right now at the, how, uh, how these sensitin 1 and 2 might be affecting the uh, the up their uptake the uptake of these structure vesicles but as you remember when we talk about sensitin 1 and sensitin 2 these proteins are not only as envelope proteins are not only important for interaction with their cell target but also they contain different uh, different regions which are of interest and one of them is what is what we call the immunosuppressive domain and the immunosuppressive domain actually has been is is a conserved region which is part of various uh, number of retroviral proteins such as HIV one <clears throat> and other uh, retroviral pro, uh, proteins envelope protein and has been known to be capable of uh, regulating or affecting the immune response and so therefore a number of people have been studying exactly those immunosuppressive domain and the Thierry Edman group has. <clears throat> has formally shown that these immunosuppressive domain, at least in sensitin 2, are functional. So we have been studying, <coughs> sorry about that, uh, these immunosuppressive domain in the context of extracellular vesicle using this approach, where in fact, we're using by flow cytometry, a number of different beads of different size and of different, uh, uh, and then uh, incubating them with uh, a, a supernatant and coming and then reincubating this supernatant, which is bound to different bees. And each bee are actually have an antibody against a, a specific cytokine. And then using a, a, a different antibody to, um, after that, being able to, to characterize specifically different cytokines based on the size of the bead and the fluorescence, which is being emitted um, uh, based on which cytokine for the bees is specific. So that allows us to give a certain number of data. For example, in this case, we have, uh, on act, we use, uh, you, in this case, we're using PBMCs, which are incubated, uh, which are activated or not. And therefore the, the little sets of dots here are representing each dot represented event. And once you stimulate using, uh, you, when you use the supernatant and you you analyze their content in terms of various cytokines. In this, in this case, we're using, looking at Th1 and Th2 cytokines. We're capable of looking how much more cytokines are being produced. In this case, you can clearly see that IL-2 interferon gamma and TNF alpha are strongly activated. And using this uh, protocol, we had done a few number of studies looking at the peptide itself, showing that actually if you use the peptide, we were able to, enact, to strongly affect the signal. So this is basically PBMCs, which are simulated this time with PMAINOMYCIN. And using the peptide, we could see that the peptide from sensitin 2 on its own had the capacity to inhibit uh, 
the uh, the uh, activation effect and therefore the production of the different cytokines which are Th1 related. So using this protocol, we decided therefore to ask ourselves, can we also uh, um, uh, corroborate what has previously been shown in terms of the capacity, first of all, of extracellular visco from um, villocytotrophoblast to inhibit the uh, Th1 cytokine activation. And this is just an example by which you're seeing that once you activate, and this is only a set of cytokines to make it simpler. And if you uh, activate PBMCs, you can see those two cytokines at the top. But when you had villocytotrophoblast uh, extracellular vesicles, you can see an important drop in activation. So the next question we asked was therefore to determine if we could actually remove the sensitin 2 from the surface of these extracellular vesicles. We use the same approach of silencing and therefore produce exosomes, uh, extracellular vesicles from the um, uh, villocytotrophoblasts which have been silenced. And then we compared what was going on. And so by looking here at the typical suppression that we're seeing in terms of Th1 cytokine production after activation with NTCD3 and NTCD28 and PBMCs, uh, we could see that actually when we were using instead of the villus cytotrophoblast um, uh, ex uh, extracellular vesicles, we were completely, we were mostly using this inhibitory function of the, villa, of the extracellular vesicle when we were using extracellular vesicle from cell which had been silenced for sensitin 2. And that is quite clear in here and in here. And in the graph we're seeing here those two different bars which shows that basically for TNF alpha and also interferon gamma, you are liberating the inhibitory function of the villus cytotrophoblast extracellular vesicles that have been all corroborated by others before, and therefore suggesting that sensitin 2 is definitely uh, playing, having a, playing an important role in this inhibition, in this inhibition mediated by extracellular vesicle. And briefly, quickly, just to tell you more about what we're thinking is that these extracellular vesicles or exosomes are actually being produced by villocytotrophoblasts and mostly by the same cytotrophoblasts. And that's the important, I kept saying villocytotrophoblasts, but at a time point that we're collecting them, it's more same cytotrophoblast-like. And they're probably interacting with the receptors, their specific receptor, allowing them therefore to being uptaken by cells, but it also possibly interacting with um, these uh, different other structures, therefore, on specific uh, immune cell population, allowing them them to be um, uh, to be affected in terms of their capacity to mount uh, immune response. Uh, quickly, I would uh, from then on, uh, since our model is basically suggesting that um, these the these extracellular vesicles that we were wor we are working on and are produced by villocytotrophoblasts or sensitotrophoblasts are actually in part behaving like retroviruses. We want to, to ask the question whether properties associated with retroviruses can also be shared with, um, um, the, um, with these extracellular vesicles. And the first thing that came to mind was galactin-1. Now galactin-1, as we know, is very important for not only in terms of the uh, regulating the immune response in term, during the pregnancy and acting directly on certain immune cell populations of placenta, but it is also known to be affecting and contributing to cell trophoblast fusion and therefore placenta development. Former studies have also shown that it is also importantly uh, mediating uh, HIV-1 infection and certain cell fusion events which are related to another retrovirus called HTLV-1. So we decided initially before looking at extracellular vesicle to see whether uh, uh, viruses that were HIV based, but with, which had the sensitin 2 protein on their surface could actually help us determine whether skeleton one might be indeed uh, increasing uh, the capacity of sensitin 2 bearing the viruses to bind and perhaps also to infect um, target cells. And what we have done quickly is that we have produced uh, uh, HIV-based pseudotype viruses which contain sensitin 2 at their surface versus other controls and look, have been studying by GFP-less phrase, their infectivity plus or minus 
um, uh, Galactum one. And you can see here some of the data showing that de depending on which cell line we're using, either uh, overexpressing MFSD2 or uh, MFSD2A uh, negative cell line. Remember that is the receptor for sensitivity 2 We had the, what exactly we were expecting in terms of infection. But most importantly, we can confirm actually that indeed using these pseudotype viruses that containing sensitivity 2 a very nice dose response in terms of increase in infectivity, which could only be present also in an ELA cell, which we're expressing in FSD2A, therefore suggesting that they're the requirement of the receptor for sensitivity 2 but could not be observed in otherwise uh, differently pseudotype viruses or non-pseudotype viruses. And we have tested different cell lines. Not only this is these were with, uh, sorry, 293 T cells or ELA cells, but we've tested different cell lines. Again, UVIC this time as a target, Jerket cells, which is a T cell line and other cell lines show that indeed galactin one was capable of increasing the infectivity of the, um, the virus, suggesting that therefore it is helping sensitin 2 to interact with the receptor. Sensitin one I was showing a different pattern, but generally speaking was again also affected uh, positively by galactin one. And the model that we are, we are, we have, we are we have generated from our, our uh, uh, result is that we believe that those pseudotype viruses are actually interacting better in the presence of galactin-1, which helps making a bridge between the receptor and the sensitin-2 or sensitin-1 protein. But our focus being sensitin-2, we decided to determine whether we could actually see the same thing with uh, again, this time extracellular vesicles, which are produced from egg 293 T cells, plus or minus GAL1 using the UVEX cell. Now, our data up to now, as you can tell, there's a certain increase, but uh, there's no very uh, important increase uh, in terms of extracellular vesicle uptake using UVEX cells uh, once galactin 1 is present. Now, one thing that I didn't tell you is that we're also, also using lactose, and generally speaking to knock down the effect of galactin-1. So that's an inhibitor of galactin-1, and you can see that there's a trend of increase, but the same trend exists for the extracellular vesicle, which are produced without the, the presence of, of sensitin-2. So therefore, there's more study that needs to be uh, performed to see whether that is, is something that is real or not. But definitely, we're expecting that, again, in that situation, galactin-1 is affecting positively the uptake uh, of these extracellular vesicles in different cell contexts. So in conclusion, based very uh, quickly, uh, we have demonstrated that our extra sensitin do once it is associated to extracellular vesicle affects positively their uptake, but also is important in the immunosuppression, which has been characterizing these extracellular vesicle, which are produced by placental cells. We believe that based on our result that Sensitin 2 in its associated form to extracellular uh, vesicle could be an important and interesting early diagnosis marker for severe preeclampsia, as I said, which is lacking right now. And finally, that galactin 1 definitely acts upon infection of pseudotype viruses, which bear sensitin 2, and hopefully that might also be the case for extracellular vesicles. Now, uh, some of the future studies that we would like to do actually based on our results, and again, I do emphasize the fact that we want to look mostly how these extracellular vesicles in their properties and their behavior might be, might compare, might share some of the properties with retroviruses. So we're definitely interested in looking at how those different envelope proteins from Earth, we have been studying the sensitive one and sensitive new bears, there's two other types of envelope proteins which might be of interest and could be on the surface of extracellular vesicle from the placenta, other tissue, and could actually be important in uh, helping uh, these extracellular vesicles either to immunosuppress cells or to interact with different cell types and being internalized. The equivalent of the mouse, as, as I've been characterized, they're called cystin A and cystin B, and both are important, mostly cystin A, for the development of the placenta and using cell lines or in vivo model, it would be very interesting to determine how much these proteins are on the surface of these extracellular vesicles and how much they are actually contributing. And these are a series of experiments 
that we were really interested to do, whether by looking at uh, how different cell targets are affected or are capable of internalizing extracellular vesicles coming from what I, we were working on, villus cytotrophoblasts, or even extra villus cytotrophoblasts, which is a different type of trophoblasts, which are part of the placenta. And also, since the earth envelope proteins that been uh, supposedly are supposedly important for myoblast fusion, in uh, it has been shown in human in the mouse. Hopefully, we would like to look at whether same principle myoblast might be producing extracellular vesicles with these are envelope proteins. Uh, other experiments also on the immunosuppressive, immunosuppressive potential is definitely needed. But as a final thought, there's one part which we really would like to know is basically determining how the biogenesis of um, extracellular vesicle might be affected by non-restriction factors. And this is a very busy slide, but basically these are all the viral, oh, these are a number of viral restriction factors which are restricting HIV-1 replication and a number of different viruses and either acting on the interaction of the virus and fusion of the virus to the cell which will be infected and that different steps going from um, reverse transcription and then even from budding to budding. But in our, in our not, uh, point of view, we believe that some of these restriction factors are likely and have been shown to be affecting uh, biogenesis and uh, a different step of the biogenesis of extracellular vesicles. So the question that we would like to know is whether this one is called e EFETM, which acts actually in the fusion of the rev viruses on the cell uh, with the cell membrane of the target cell, could actually be altering equally the capacity of uh, and of uh, um, extracellular vesicle to interact or, or to bind or to eventually uh, fuse with the endosome membrane. Same thing here. We know that tetrin is also a protein which is actually affecting uh, the budding and or the liberate final liberation of uh, budding retroviruses. So and it has been known by a study from Edgar et al. in a few years ago that actually exosome or extracellular vesicle remain bound to uh, producing cells because due to that same protein called tetrin or BST2. And we are also looking at whether in our system with using the same extracellular vesicle, we can look a similar tethering of the uh, ex of the extracellular vesicle to the membrane once tethering is being produced. And most important, most interestingly, is that for those phenomena, envelope proteins, uh, in the case of HIV being GP140, GP41, are determinants which can actually, not only other protein, but can actually help in inhibiting the function of these restriction factors. So the question is whether cysteine 1 and 2R could equally be acting in our system to inhibit the uh, limiting factor, limiting function of these factors, which would therefore affect either the liberation or the entry, the entrance of these uh, these extracellular vesicle to target cell versus producing cells. So I'm sorry if I took a bit more time, but I, this is my last slide. I promise, just to acknowledge uh, the people from my team who has been working on this project, and mostly Amandine Vargas, Gassien, Lucas, and Caroline Tudzik which are uh, in that photo, which have been contributing and uh, the, uh, deriving most of the results. Uh, we have important collaboration and I would like also to uh, thank uh, PIA, the uh, different granting agency, which with, without whom we couldn't be, without which we couldn't do uh, these studies. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Hi, thank you uh, for this beautiful presentation. Um, there, are, there are a few questions um, from the audience. So we'll start with um, Vladimir Bokun, who asked me to ask the question because his microphone is not functional at the moment. Um, so it's actually two questions. One is whether since it's in two uh, reduction, um, in the CTB EVs is specific to preeclampsia uh, or if it could also happen in other pregnancy-related disorders? 
so, so a lot of studies have looked mostly at sensitin one and sensitin one has been shown therefore to be also reduced in terms of their abundance in different disorders. For sensitin two, uh, most of the, uh, we are, a very few studies have been done on sensitin two and uh, there's been uh, most of the focus in our, in our knowledge has been on preeclampsia showing that there was a clear a reduction of sensitin 2 in preeclampsia. For other diseases, most of the, uh, or disorders, most of the studies have been looking at sensitin 1. So uh, I would say that for now, sensitin 2 is definitely uh, uh, related, associated to preeclampsia, and there's more study that needs to be done to determine how, how this protein might be uh, affected in terms of its abundance uh, to, toward these different disorders. Okay, and as a follow-up, I missed how early uh, can this predict preeclampsia? Or I oh, mean yes, but basically what we so we have looked at how these the abundance of these proteins on the surface of extracellular vesicle could actually be used to um, to um, monitor early or early. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, predispose a woman toward preeclampsia. And what our results suggest is that there seems to be a, a clear, a, a, a good evidence that this is the case. We need, the problem is that we need a lot, our courts, we started the court and been in with, I think 300 women, but uh, it was very difficult to make a follow-up, to do a follow-up. And most preeclampsia, preeclamptic case are, either mild or um, or being uh, just, or very low in symptoms. We're, and we need to look at severe symptoms. And that's why it was very difficult in terms of our analysis to make sure that it was statistically significant. But we'll need a higher number of, of women to make sure that this association or the, the predictive value of the sensitive 2 associated to extracellular vesicle really old. Okay. Uh, Vladimir also had another question, which is also my question. If you, um, if you have any idea about what extracellular vesicle population these proteins might be associated with? We don't know. I mean, we've been looking at, uh, initially, we, we have been using differential ultracentrification to isolate our, um, our markers. We have used CD63, um, I, which is definitely not the best. We have not focused mostly on exactly determining which type of extracellular vesicle. Obviously, more uh, analysis needs to be done. Uh, and But at, at this moment, we have not gone through the, all the details and we need to do so in order for, I mean, to understand better how these, uh, mm -hmm. these vesicles, which vesicles are bearing these proteins. Now, the important thing to know is, is that the sensitotrophoblast, that structure, produces a lot of vesicles. They're producing micro vesicles, which are actually even called sensitotrophoblast micro vesicles and mm -hmm. are also, has been known for a while to just uh, travel through the bloodstream of the pregnant woman. So uh, th there's a lot of shedding, a lot of different either micro vesicles, apoptotic bodies being produced and Definitely, we we have a lot of a, a, ver, a great variety of vesicles present in our supernatant, and it we really need to focus more on exactly to determine which vesicle contains our protein. And that's a very important question. Is there anything? I mean, as a curiosity, is there anything in the structure of these proteins that might make them specific for? like exosome-like vesicles or small vesicles? No, we don't know. We, we, there, there might not be. I, I mean, the proteins are basically at the plasma membrane. And I mean, when the endosome is formed, I think if it goes through the typical uh, exosome um, uh, biogenesis, these proteins will likely uh, be also part of these exosomes of other extracellular vesicles. But uh, there, I'm not sure exactly what... Um, Actually, if what kind of uh, if there's any uh, signal, a stretch of amino acid which allows them to be specifically uh, part of these exosomes. Now, the other thing is the important thing is that the reason why we're stressing so much the uh, similarity between retroviruses 
an extracellular vesicle is be because a lot of study have been shown showing that actually retroviruses when they're replicating and during their life cycle their replicative cycle are using components of the exosome biogenesis to produce these particles and therefore to mature and eventually to be uh, uh, to be uh, but to butt out from the um, from the cell so it is it is a certain uh, it's not obvious but it i mean there's a certain similarity there which helps us suggest that definitely these envelope proteins might have kept the same capacity to be not this time part of an of a budding retrovirus but to be part of the exosome or extracellular vesicle and by the same way that it it is capable of being on the surface of a retrovirus because they're sharing the same types of uh, biogenesis, and that's our the, that's the way we we are 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 looking at uh, the, the that those com common uh, properties. Okay, I also I found very interesting the multi-analyte flow assay that yeah. you showed. Can, can you can you can you give some more details about? I mean, how how many markers can you do simultaneously? And I didn't understand how it does work. Like the, the well, body. it goes on in terms of the bead size and the anti. So you had an antibody with first the bead as a certain antibodies which is specific to your cytokine, and the beads have different size. So already you can have a different a certain uh, variety in terms of signals that you'll detect on the flow cytometry. And then you incubate your your uh, your supernatant with these beads and you come back with another set of antibodies which are have a fluorochrome which is specific to a, a certain fluorescent. And that will give you a second signal which will give you, you're capable of identifying each cytokine differently. Now, the what we add in terms of kit was a Th1, Th2 cytokine. Kit. Yeah. So that assay was allowing us to, uh, I think, to um, quantify something like uh, um, around 10 cytokines simultaneously. But depending on what you want to quantify, there's different kits which allows you from a supernatant to quantify different types of either chemokines or, or different types of cytokines. So there's a certain variety. And that really helped us at least simultaneously to look at a variety of cytokines at the same time and look at exactly how those different treatments, either activation, either addition of extracellular vesicle, how they affect those different cytokines, those different cytokines. And then that uh, analysis was done directly and we could therefore see that certain cytokines were not moving because they should, while others were being strongly uh, suppressed. And, the, and also they, in these kits, they give you a, uh, standard curves, which allows you to really make a, a very clear quantification of the amount of cytokines that you have, sorry, that you have quantified in your assay. Okay, I actually have a last question, and then I'll pass it to Carolina. So you also showed oh, in the Galactin one data data yeah. set that's very very interesting. Uh, but I was wondering, is there any chance that GAL, GAL1 is also precipitated with the vesicles? Because with, with what, sorry? That is already in the pellet with the vesicles normally, because you're not really okay. separating the vesicles from the soluble proteins, I believe. Yeah, well, I, well we normally, uh, galactin one is not that much abundant in certain cells. And so we are we have used extra uh, viruses and extracellular vesicle from different preparation. We've used them from X293 T cells. We've used them for villus cytotrophoblasts. And that, in terms of villus cytotrophoblasts, it's true that, okay, yeah, I, that could be definitely affecting, perhaps you're right, in, in, that, that could be affecting our results. So that's something that we definitely need to take into consideration. The other thing is, I mean, we there's other galactin being produced. I mean, we we know that galactin three might be also involved, and although our results show that galactin three is not actually out, uh, affecting uh, the uh, pseudotype infection or uh, as much as galactin one, but that is also something of concern. So in terms of our experiment with extracellular risk, that's a very good point, and we could actually really uh, knock down uh, galactin-1 expression from the cells which are produced and therefore look at what, what be, might happen for extracellular vesicles. But for the 
infect uh, the uh, pseudo type infection assay, I think that these results are, are more uh, well, well, they were clear and they were showing exactly what was going on. Okay, Carolina. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Benoit, for a great talk. And um, I have some questions, just uh, my curiosity, I guess. It's not yeah. really directly related, but I was just wondering whether you can comment on uh, what is the sort of potential crosstalk between the replicating or non-retroviral uh, with the EV pathway. For example, like the coronavirus, the infectious disease related. Is there is there a sort of like... Uh, is there anything that we can sort of like extrapolate? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, in, sorry. In my case, the thing is, so we, we've been looking at, at two, um, envelope proteins, which are on the surface of extracellular vesicles. And so therefore, b b beside the presence of these proteins, there's nothing else. I mean, there's no capsid, there's no what we believe, perhaps there's viral-like genome, but probably mutated. So the only potentially, and I could be wrong, I mean, the only potentially um, functional element of these human endogenous retroviruses, as far as we can tell and the way we've studied, are these envelope proteins. And so therefore, that's about it. We cannot, they're not, once they're on the surface of the ex extracellular vesicle, they don't act like viruses. Now, when we're looking at HIV and all those viruses, they're using some of the uh, uh, exome biogenesis. But if you want, if we now consider the wider aspect of what's going in terms of viruses and how they uh, could be transmitted or out extracellular vesicle might be helping either viral spread or um, or other aspect which is related to viral infection and also for SARS-CoV-2. I mean, there's been a multitude of hypotheses, the multitude of results showing that the viral genome of a virus could be in those extracellular vesicles and could be actually uptaken by other cells without the normal direct viral uh, uh, viral replication uh, pathway. And uh, that has already been suggested for SARS-CoV-2 uh, versus the cardiomyocyte, I think. And so therefore there's that possibility that these extracellular vesicles are indeed be, uh, uh, contributing to viral spread just by spreading the genome plus a certain number of proteins. It is, but if you, I mean, I've looked at just the literature, it's extremely complicated because as, as was question, the question was asked, I mean, you have to make sure that you can even separate viruses from, from those extracellular vesicles, making sure that you're not, I mean, seeing something which is uh, due to some uh, contamination. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of going on. And for HIV, they've shown that, uh, for example, NAF protein is definitely part of these, is vehiculated through these extracellular vesicle, potentially affecting surrounding cells, affecting their, um, their capacity to be infected. And so it's a very complicated field. And finally, but however, there has been studies which show that certain and mostly non-enveloped viruses, they can actually, uh, uh, they can actually be transported together, not only one particle, but a number of particles to these large vesicles and therefore being taken by certain cells and be accentuate the infection. And they're also talking about something like more like cooperate, co cooperating interaction between quasi-species virus, which actually might be beneficial for these viruses to more properly infect different cells. So it's a very broad uh, uh, topic. And there's been some studies which uh, seems to suggest that extracellular vesicles are definitely important to help even controlling the immune response, but also generating a more thorough and more elaborate uh, viral spread. So um, that, that is a very fascinating thing. But I have to admit that our story is really related to extracellular vesicle and what is on its surface and how these proteins that we have kept for millions of years. I mean, we're talking about 20 or even 40 millions of years that these sequences have been co-opted in our genome. 
the, the thing is, they're not only useful for the placenta or whatever fusion events between cells, but our what we are claiming is that they are on the surface of these extracellular vesicles and might be acting exactly as they were acting on the surface of viruses and offering and creating immune suppression and even offering a certain tropism as what we refer to viruses. Viruses have tropism for certain cells, target cells. We're suggesting that in that context, extracellular vesicles with these protein might have a tropism or increased tropism for certain cells which have the proper receptor. And that's some of what some of our data has shown up to now. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting that um, it's also, uh, well, you mentioned that it was on the surface protein, but then uh, the data shows that uh, the vesicles are about 50 nanometer, which is likely yeah. uh, to be endosomal um, origins. Yeah. So um, that'll be interesting to see whether there is sort of like interaction there between the plasma membrane and the endosome. Oh, sure. Really originated there. Yeah. But, 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 some mm -hmm. us, but we have also seen, I mean, we've seen 50 nanometers, those nanometer, this way, but we have also seen in the spike being going up to 100 nanometers. So the 50 nanometers were measured more on electron microscopy. And I would, I'm more, uh, I, I, the, our other analysis that we've done, uh, have been more uh, are more clear showing that it's more it's closer to 100 nanometer again showing again, the uh, similarity in terms of size to uh, retroviruses so that that data is more closer to uh, 100 nanometer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, Dolores, is there any more questions or? Um... Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, so we shall close the meeting. Thank you again, uh, Benoel, for a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank uh, you for inviting me. Learned so much about the retrovirus and the preeclampsia. So today, 